Welcome to The Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. This episode is brought to you by Wondrium. Wondrium. That's right. W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M. This is the new name of the former Great Courses Plus, and it's much broader, much cooler, much greater than uh, they've offered before. You remember that The Great Courses is a longtime supporter of this podcast. You remember that little app I would always show? I'm going to show you to that, show you that again in a minute. Uh, but Wondrium offers fantastic video and audio learning experiences, tons of great content to enrich our lives with mind-blowing moments, all the stuff from the great courses that you're used to, all those great lectures with uh, dozens of lectures in each course and therefore thousands of lectures. But now they've added videos created in partnership with National Geographic, Smithsonian, the History Channel, the Culinary Institute of America, and many more. Plus, they're producing original documentary series. Wondrium is the new Great Courses Plus, new and improved, and it's fantastic. Can't wait for uh, you to give it a try. Uh, let me show you. For example, I just started this off yesterday. So I touched the now Wondrium app. It opens right up on my phone. And look at that. There's a course called Everything and Nothing. What is it? It's not a course. It's a documentary film. It's so cool. And, uh, and so there, there's two uh, documentaries. They're each an hour long. So if you go to episode one uh, and you join the host, who's a physicist, and he starts talking about, he's holding up his finger there. He has a single grain of sand on there and asks us to imagine the sun as the size of this single grain of sand. And all those grains of sands on the beach would be the number of... The single grain of sand. There it is. It's so cool. And then he imagines like the entire beach he's standing on is like the galaxy, hundreds of billions of stars. Anyway, it's so cool. So here's the deal. If you uh, go to wondrium.com slash Shermer, you get a 14-day free trial, unlimited access, all of that great content for free. Uh, so it's wondrium.com slash Shermer. Again, wondrium is spelled W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Shermer. Again, wondrium.com slash Shermer. Give it a try. You're going to love it. I sure do. My guest today is Jonathan Rausch with his new book, The Constitution of Knowledge, A Defense of Truth. This is the best book I've read since Stephen Pinker's Enlightenment Now, which I say on the podcast, uh, because it deals with uh, the important issue of truth. How do we know what's true? How do we know what we should believe? Uh, and not just free speech, but also what he's calling the constitution of knowledge, the, the overall superstructure of how we get to the, uh, the truth and who we should trust. Jonathan is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. He's the author of books and articles on a wide range of subjects, including politics, public policy, culture, and LGBT rights, and is the winner of multiple prizes, including the 2005 National Magazine Award for Columns. In commentary, and as I note at the beginning of our conversation, he's also the author of Kindly Inquisitors, which was published in 1993, is Vigorous Defense of Free Speech uh, and Open Inquiry then. And so we start off by just talking a little bit about what's changed since 1993 uh, and what happened. Why is it that it used to be liberals that were in support of uh, free speech and open uh, dialogue and, and commentary, and now it seems to be reversed then we get into um, how we know anything is true, what, what is truth, how do you distinguish between empirical truths and, say, political, religious, artistic truths. And uh, as you'll see, he differs from me on that, that he thinks there's very little difference there, and that, uh, in fact, they uh, almost everything is based on some kind of empirical uh, knowledge that we can understand. So we talk about how knowledge gets validated, then we talk about um, the pushback or whatabouts with free speech, like what about fraud, libel, perjury, blackmail, espionage, etc. About hate speech and words as violence, and um, and you know what? How should we respond to that kind of argument? And uh, we talk about social media companies and to what extent the the role they played in um, in creating these bubbles of of uh, knowledge that we live in and uh, make things more divisive between liberals and conservatives. We talk about the uh, both uh, Trump and the far right and uh, woke progressives on the far left and how both sides have really kind of violated this constitution of knowledge and what we can do to kind of rein them back in. 
And in between that, we, we cover a lot of different uh, hot button topics that I think you'll enjoy. So please uh, enjoy this conversation with Jonathan Rausch and his new book, Constitution of Knowledge. The Constitution of Knowledge, A great. Defense of Truth. Jonathan Rausch, this is the most important book I've read since Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now. Uh, and that's saying a lot because I love that book, but it's important because uh, particularly of the times that uh, we're living in. But before we get into all that, uh, you have a little bit of autobiographical information at the uh, start of the book. So why don't you give us a little uh, a brief um, uh, walk through your, your past, a little autobiography for you know, where you grew up and where you went to school and why you decided to become a journalist, and then what led you to, re- uh, to, to write uh, your classic, uh, uh, Kindly Inquisitors, 1993, and then why you wrote this book. What's changed since 1993? <laughs> and you want that in 30 <laughs> no, seconds or less. you can t- less. take as much time as you okay. want. We have no hard out here. Um. Deep breath. Born in Phoenix, Arizona in 1960. Kind of a libertarian state back in those days. Public schools, public high school, Yale University. Was gay, but didn't know it, didn't deal with that till I was 25 years old. Uh, But that always made me feel like something of an outsider and gave me the perspective of someone who thought that um, was kind of a dissident. Always became a journalist because I was too curious and too restless to settle down and pick up a real profession like, you know, law or academia. In 1989, I'd always been a kind of free speech nut. I'm not sure why, but going back to my days reading Bertrand Russell in high school. 1989, I was just about to turn 29 and the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini announced fatwa against the life of Salman Rushdie. And the effect of that in the West was a lot of hemming and hawing. You know, well, he shouldn't do that. That's really bad. But Rushdie shouldn't be writing books that are offensive to Muslim. What does he expect? Uh, George W. H. W. Bush, Margaret Thatcher. These people were, I thought, responded very poorly and didn't understand the stakes because it seemed to me what was going on here was an attempt to chill speech across borders internationally, something we hadn't seen before. That got me... That got me very passionate, the way only young people can be. I quit my job to write a book that became Kindly Inquisitors, The New Attacks on Free Thought, published by University of Chicago Press and the Cato Institute, the libertarian think tank, in 1993. And that book got a front page review in the New York Times book review and then disappeared without a trace. It, it just got almost no traction until about five years ago. We saw a second round of, in some cases, really quite similar attacks on freedom of speech, freedom, freedom of thought, dissent, academic freedom. And this book, Kindly Inquisitors, was rediscovered. Um, now it, it's, it's going to be a classic. Meanwhile, however, time had marched on. And the threats that I thought were the big threats in 1993 had given way to other threats. And those things, when I started the work on this book, didn't really have names like cancel culture. Um, And the idea of trolling, for example, had only just emerged. But I recognized that we were seeing a new version of what I'd seen in 1993, and that's this. And here we get to the nub of the subject matter. This wasn't just kind of random activism of an unpleasant nature, nor was it just an attack on free speech per se. What we were seeing was a sophisticated information attack on the system that that we've built and that we rely on to keep our society collectively moored to reality. I call it liberal science in Kindly Inquisitors. I call it the constitution of knowledge and the reality-based community in this new book. But it's not just free speech. It's a whole set of institutions and norms that took 400 years to build. And they're robust, but they're also delicate. And they aren't just about free speech. They require us to go through a lot of protocols and a lot of learning and a lot of discipline in order to make knowledge, to have a global conversation in a structured way. And you can attack it. It's like the U.S. Constitution. Uh, You can attack it. And I realized that was what was happening. And that's when I realized it was time to come back to the subject and write about all this stuff that has to go right, all of these social settings that we've got to do in order to turn disagreement into knowledge. And that's this book. Yeah, I I read your Kindly Inquisitors when it came out. And uh, that was 93. We started Skeptic Magazine in 92. Really? So you were the reader. I've always I, wanted I was to the one, you. yeah, I'm the one, yeah. 
uh, well, you but you dealt with the creationists, uh, if I recall, in that book, and and the, and we were addressing them at the time. And there was some, uh, you know, kind of movement among scientists. Well, these people should just be, you know, canceled, censored, whatever words they were using at that time. And I thought, no, actually, you know, Jonathan Rausch made this great argument that, you know, their arguments should be heard in the public forum. Let everybody have their voice. And it's clear that they're wrong once you line up all their claims and all the rebuttals to them, particularly in print. It's harder to do in debate format because you have... People like Dwayne Gish does his Gish Gallup where he throws up 50 slides in 10 minutes and then you have 15 minutes to re refute all of them. Not doable in a public forum like that in a debate, but in print you can and that's the way to handle it. And and to me, that kind of set the stage for, you know, the rest of the work we, we've done in Skeptic. Just you know, line up the claims and here's the rebuttal to them rather than, oh, they're just a bunch of religious nuts or they're Holocaust, you know, the Holocaust deniers are just anti-Semites as if that's an argument, and that's that's not an argument. So uh, I do recall that, and then I saw, I, I was going to reread it when I was researching uh, The Moral Arc, and uh, and then I noticed on, I got into Audible books heavily, and I noticed Penn Jillette read your Kindly Inquisitors, which was great, because he's got such a great voice uh, for audiobooks, and of course he's, he's, he's a, a libertarian as well, so... Uh, yeah, so I, th I, I thought that was a good timing on that. And the nation's leading comedy magician. <laughs> That's right, yes. How many people have had their works of epistemology read by the nation's leading I comedy know. magician? <laughs> That's right, yes. Well, so in, in, the, in the moral arc, here's how I used your, your, your work. Uh, not, not just that book, but also your gay marriage, why it is good for gays, good for straights, and good for America. This is when you were on your book tour for that, and you wrote a piece in The Atlantic about the book tour. And... and uh, and your radio interviews. And so you write, your guest, he said, meaning me, is the most dangerous man in America. Why? Because, said the caller, he sounds so reasonable. In hindsight, now you're speaking, in hindsight, this may be the greatest compliment I've ever been paid. It is certainly among the most sincere. Despite the caller's best efforts to shut out what I was saying, the debate he was hearing and the contrast between me and my adversary was working on him. I doubt that he changed his mind that day, but I could tell he was thinking, almost against his will. Hannah Arant once wrote, truth carries within itself an element of coercion. Close quote from Arant. The caller felt that he was, in some sense, being forced to see the merit in what I was saying. <laughs> and then I used that as an example of how, although you, sometimes you have to have laws that are passed from the top down, ultimately you need to change people's minds. Uh, about how they think about, you know, blacks and Jews and gays and so forth, point of this passage here, and that uh, you write, quote, I think this is also from that Atlantic piece, history shows that the more open the intellectual environment, the better minorities do. We learn empirically that women are as intelligent and capable as men. This knowledge strengthens the moral claims of gender equality. We learn from social experience that laws permitting religious pluralism make societies more governable. This knowledge strengthens the moral claims of religious liberty. We learn from critical argument that the notion that some races are fit to be enslaved by others is impossible to defend without recourse to hypocrisy and mendacity. This knowledge strengthens the moral claims of inherent human dignity. So that was, you know, what now, five years ago. A lot's happened since then. Does it feel like we can still just win the battle of ideas through open debate or or, or are the forces of, of uh, cancel culture and censoriousness too strong now? Well, there are three big ideas in this new book, and I'll just throw them at you because you just brought one of them up. But maybe it'll also give us a little bit of structure to think about as, as we talk through some of these ideas. Idea number one, it's not the marketplace of ideas. It's the constitution of knowledge. If you think you're just defending freedom and that's all you have to do, freedom is necessary but it's not sufficient. We forgot about all the other things that have to go right in order to make knowledge and resolve disagreements productively and peacefully, which is super hard. Big idea number two, you're being manipulated. There are systematic sophisticated and very effective ta uh, attacks going on from many co many corners, especially these days, the right, but also the left, on the constitution of knowledge, on the systems that we rely on to keep us real, sane, smart, uh, and, and civic, uh, and civil as a society. 
Uh, this this stuff that's happening right now, you know, around election misinformation and polarization and all of that, it's it's not just a sort of natural phenomenon. It's being done to us by nameable organizations and individuals for political gain and profit. We are being manipulated. We got to understand that. And point number three is they're not ten feet tall. We are. If we understand what's being done, what the tactics are that's being used, and begin to focus on countering them, I think. In the long run, we squash them like a bug. But that depends on people's understanding what's going on here. That, that what's being waged is a kind of epistemic warfare, not a term people are used to hearing. We do have to understand this doesn't just solve itself through the exertion of free speech. More is necessary than that. That goes to your question, Michael. No, it doesn't. This isn't automatically solved by more speech. Um, it's not an ACLU type of censorship problem. It's a different kind of problem of people deliberately undermining the systems, the values, the norms that we depend on to understand the world around us in a coherent, rational way. Well, we're roughly the same age, and so we remember Richard Nixon famously uh, hating the press and saying, you, you know, when he quit the first time, you'll not have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. And, you know, he just hated the press as much as seemingly like Trump does. But somehow this feels different. Is it, is it different? Uh, I mean, is this just the recency effect? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is different from, yeah, Trump doesn't hate the press. He loves the press. Nixon really hated the press, but Trump uses the press and gins up this, this hatred. So it's sometimes good to talk about the constitution of knowledge before talking about the attacks on it, yeah. just to lay some groundwork. Yeah, but I'm happy to go straight to Trump no, 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 go, let's, and what's let's different Trump, right yeah. now, if, if you'd like to start No, let's there. do epistemology. Yeah, how do we know what we know? <laughs> okay, so here's the fundamental problem. I'm going to, this is going to be a, a, a highly schematized rendering, but, but you'll bear with me. You and your listeners will, will forgive that. Every society, large or small, small tribe, gigantic nation, has a problem, and that's how do you settle disagreements of opinion in a productive way. Humans are wired to be very biased in all kinds of ways. Our biases don't cancel out. They actually can compound each other. The two biggest are confirmation bias and conformity bias. Confirmation bias is we look for, and in fact, our brains even register cognitions and ideas that enhance our status, our beliefs about ourselves. Um, conformity bias means that we look to others to conform what we believe, and typically we look to others who believe what we believe. Well, the result of that is that if you just have a completely unstructured conversation, people will gravitate toward other people like themselves, they'll confirm each other's biases, they'll go down rabbit holes, often known as, for example, um, religious beliefs or political beliefs. They'll break off into sects. The sects will be unable to live with each other to come to any reasonable conclusion. They'll lose touch with reality. They'll go to war with each other. Um, and Pretty soon you get sectarianism, you get violence, or you get the emergence of a prince or a potentate or a priest or a, or a demigod who basically decrees what we have to believe. And that's how it was done until about 400 years ago with terrible bloody consequences and with the result that the human species didn't really learn very much century after century. Um, 400 years ago, some people come up very consciously. Again, these are nameable people. Um, with a different way of doing it. Starts with people like Locke and Montaigne, but also working scientists like Newton, foundation of the Royal Society, first great scientific organization. And they say, wait a minute, this is all wrong. Instead of looking to authorities or wars or sects to decide what's right, let's outsource that. Let's say the rule is going to be that in order to establish that something is true, Jonathan Rausch has to persuade Michael Shermer. Or, he ha or they both have to persuade people that they, don't even, that they don't know, that may not speak the same language, that have a totally different perspective. And let's call that empiricism. Let's say that the only way to make knowledge is with, to check with people who are different from yourselves and persuade them. You can't use force. And all these people who don't know each other have to be able to interact. Whatever I do to establish something is true should work in principle for anyone, regardless of nationality, creed, color, everything else. And then they said, wait a minute, we can build a network out of this. 
we can create a global scientific community of people checking each other's beliefs, channeling their conflicts into organized efforts to figure out who's right and who's wrong, and we'll add something else, another great social innovation. Until then, people said the price for being wrong is you lose your job, you lose your head, you get ostracized from society. Now the price for making mistakes is just going to be, well, you lose the argument. But we encourage people to make mistakes. The trick to this whole enterprise will make mistakes incredibly quickly. And we'll find them incredibly quickly. We'll set up a global network that will be able to vet hypotheses at the rate of millions a day, virtually all of which will be wrong. But that's going to be, it's going to be those rare ones that we are going to find and accumulate knowledge. This becomes what we call science, but it's also literary criticism, journalism, the law works according to these principles. I call it all the reality-based con- reality community and it's based on a constitution of knowledge, which, much like the U.S. Constitution, creates this gigantic system that allows strangers to cooperate by persuading and compromising. So it's fantastic. It's, it's a species-transforming development. As, as Jonathan Haidt says, this allows us homo sapiens to function far above our design capacity. And it allows us to create this carapace of objective knowledge, which is a real thing and fantastically valuable. It exists outside ourselves. All of us could die. The entire species could die off. Aliens could come along, decode our books, reconstitute our databases, and use all that knowledge. Just like that. This is an amazing thing that humanity has done. We owe it to the constitution of knowledge and to the constitution of knowledge. We owe the end of wars of reality, these sectarian wars where people settle differences of agreement, uh, of disagreements, in other words, as they did in the Thirty Years' War, by going to war and wiping each other out. That doesn't work in science. We don't do it that way. So that's, forgive me, I went on a bit, but... that's perfect. That's beautiful. That's the groundwork for what I think is the big concept of this book, the Constitution of Knowledge. But here's the thing, it doesn't arise spontaneously. It's not just free speech. You need to train scientists and literary critics. You need law schools and journalism schools and ethics codes and professional organizations and administrative agencies and statistical agencies like, you know, National National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. You need newsrooms, journalistic ethics codes, societies of editors. You need conferences and periodicals, and peer reviews, and more and more and more, on and on and on. You need all that stuff to make it work. And then comes this crowd who says, wait a minute, we can circumvent and undermine all that. And that's the attack we have today. Thank you for letting me <laughs> oh, no, do was, all of that. That was perfect. Uh, I mean, that's what it, really what we do, Skeptic Magazine. You know, that's In a way, we're providing tools of how to think about fringe claims that scientists really mostly don't have the time to deal with the flat earthers and, and, you know, the creationists and and so forth. UFOs is in the news now. I've just been amazed at how gullible most people, including scientists who, you know, they watch these videos and they think, well, I don't know what it is. So yeah, maybe we're being visited or maybe it's Russian assets or whatever, you know, but if you dig into the skeptical community, we have institutional memory. Well, we've seen videos like that. We've seen claims like that. 25 years ago, I remember this thing and boom, boom, boom. And here's what we think is actually going on, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's what you're talking about by a constitution of, of knowledge. Yes, exactly. Uh, we do that. Now, just for fun, let's... And it's cumulative. It's just what you said. We don't have to start from scratch every day. Wake up and say, we've never seen this before. Yes, to the point where you can just invoke certain principles, like the EGRI principle, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, or principle proportionality from Hume. You know, you apportion your confidence in the belief to the evidence for it. And just really basic stuff like that. It's like, oh, all right. So you don't have to have like two paragraph long argument, just a single sentence. Oh, okay. Or, you know, before Mm -hmm. you say something is out of this world, first make sure that it's not in this world or Hitchens dictum, you know, that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence and so forth. So we have a whole slew of these things. And, uh, but just for fun, let's, let's do a kind of a thought experiment here. You know, there's this idea this what you know, pretty crazy idea that you know we we might be in the matrix or we might be a brain in a vat, uh, floating around in some fluid and some uh, you know mad uh, scientist in another galaxy or something is 
you know, stimulating our neurons to fire and creating this reality. And, and uh, you and I don't actually exist in the physical world. But, it, you know, that's pretty out there. But in a way, it's kind of true. We are a brain and a vat, you know, a, a vat of cerebral uh, spinal fluid in, in which, you know, the, the information coming in, like the photons of light bouncing off this glass, um, I don't see the glass or the water. I, I just, th th they're just neurons firing, right? And, and then I can kind of corroborate my vision with my physical uh, touch around it. It feels round. It looks round. But maybe I'm hallucinating, so I can show it to you and go, are you seeing what I'm seeing? And you go, yeah, yeah, you're holding a cup, uh, you know, water. Okay, so then we have some, you know, kind of confirmation between two observers, and we can build a kind of correspondence theory of truth and, and so forth. So forth. And, and, and really, that's... That's the problem we ultimately have to solve is how do you know what's actually true? So if the aliens come here, presumably they could deconstruct N Newtonian mechanics and Einsteinian relativity, you know, but would they, re would they reinvent or get something out of art or Shakespeare or would they reconstruct something like a biblical worldview of religion? That to me feels more made up or constructed rather than discovered. So how do you distinguish between, like, say, empirical truths that are out there that me and you and the aliens can all see versus these more subjective truths, like religious truths or artistic truths? So that's such an interesting question, and I don't think anyone's going to ask me that except you. So I'm, I'm delighted that you brought it up. Because it's something I've given a lot of thought to, and there's a section in the book about it, which, by the way, you may disagree with, but I'll try it out on you. So... I don't accept the distinction between hard facts that are empirically verifiable and norms and values that are not. I accept the distinction between things that are easy to adjudicate as a social question using well-understood rules and things that are hard or sometimes even impossible to adjudicate using those rules. But I put them on a spectrum. And it turns out the constitution of knowledge, the system that we have, of throwing everything into this network of impersonal observers using impersonal rules to verify, sure, it can be used for simple, objective, empirical propositions like the boiling of water, boiling point of water is 212 degrees. But it can also be used for moral propositions. Like, for example, homosexual love is the moral equivalent of heterosexual love. Now, the second type of proposition is a values proposition, and it's not going to be resolved quickly and crisply. But the constitution of knowledge, this process can organize the conversation so that people are forced, if they want to be part of this conversation, to look for evidence and arguments and make that case. And over time, as they do that, over the decades, they will tend to be forced to a conclusion. And that conclusion, in general, will advance human flourishing. A great example of this is racism. Racism is as deeply embedded in human thinking, as ancient as anything you can imagine. It goes away when, over time, people making these racist pronouncements, not just the empirical ones, but the values one that says some people are of less worth and less dignity than others, are subjected to this organized system of critical, rational scrutiny. And guess what? It turns out the racist beliefs don't hold up very well. They're too inconsistent with too many other things that we care about. They're too inconsistent with too many facts. Same with homosexuality. Same with women being unequal. So you can run the tape of a society that's running according to these principles of the constitution of knowledge, and it's invariably, you can tell which way the tape is running because it will be running toward greater human dignity and human flourishing over time. So what I'm maintaining here is that, in fact, it's not just the glass of water that we can use the Constitution of Knowledge for. It's almost any kind of question where we agree to subject ourselves to the disciplines of checking and of these impersonal rules and institutions. Wow. Well, actually, you and I are, are pretty close to agreement on that. In fact, you and I and Steve Pinker and Sam Harris and maybe Jonathan Haidt and a few others, but not many, uh, think that there's a lot of overlap between facts and values and that uh, many times, maybe most of the time, you can derive oughts from ises. The way the world is should dictate the way the world ought to be. 
I, I don't mean slavery is natural, so slavery is good. I mean, these are the conditions of, say, war and what makes it go up or down. And understanding that allows us to make them go down by tweaking the variables, something like that. And um, but so but, but where it gets a little tricky is where maybe you have, where you, as you said, in, in the harder problems where you have, say, rights conflicts. Maybe you say, uh, OK, so trans should have rights like like gays have rights and lesbians have rights and rights and so forth. Yes, of course. Uh, but but what happens when a trans man, a man you know, male to female trans wants to compete in the female division of sports. My listeners are going to get tired of me bringing this subject up. It's, it's only a, a test case uh, for, for how to solve uh, conflicting rights. So you have women on the one hand who have earned the right to compete against only other women because of the biological differences between men and women. And then you have a trans uh, woman who used to be a biological man who still contains substantial physical um, abilities more than the women. And so they feel uh, you know, that it's not fair. So uh, to me, this is the, the really hard problem. You know, how do you solve, resolve rights conflicts? Uh, I don't see an experiment that could do that or new evidence or data. You know, it's just, we just decide uh, analogously, you know, pro-choice versus pro-life, both sets of, have good arguments. Both sides have good arguments. It just depends on what the society wants to emphasize the rights of well, but, but does it, Michael? Are, are you doing justice, really, to the organizing powers of the system that you and the skeptic are such powerful advocates of? Because it's not just a question of, of whether you can get a crisp resolution of a rights, a rights, a goods versus good, rights versus rights type of conflict. Of course, usually you can't. But isn't it possible that using the system, you can organize that conversation in a constructive way? So that at least people with different points of view can establish some empirical points that they may have in common, locate their disagreements, go out and say, okay, well, what do we need to know to narrow those disagreements? Maybe it's a case, maybe we need to know more about endocrinology. Maybe we need to agree on what the purpose is of sports. Maybe we need to understand something about fetal development. And none of those things by itself will resolve it but it will allow some cooperation between people of very different, different, different views on a path toward moving the argument along constructively. I'm claiming only the constitution of knowledge can do that. The other way to do it is I'm right, you're wrong, you're murdering babies, I have to kill you to stop right. murdering babies, or I have to pass laws to stop you from murdering babies. No conversation ensues there. There's no agenda there to develop ideas and work toward consensus. I agree with that for sure. Um, although, see, with the law, you, you have to draw the line somewhere, and so you say, "Well, okay, this you do second end of the second trimester, no later than that for an abortion." And as you know, conservatives are pushing to make that earlier and earlier, and maybe even overturn Roe v. Wade. So there, that's why you get this, you know, heated uh, exchanges because there's a lot at yeah, stake. Yeah, and it's yeah. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, it's, you're going to have to make laws based on imperfect uh, judgments and lack of consensus. It happens all the time. It's, it's just part of life. But even there, you know, abortion has, the, the conversation has changed as we've learned more about fetal development. And people are moving. There is something of a consensus on abortion, sort of like safe, legal, and rare. And I think that's going to continue to firm up as more of this evidence and conversation happens. It will come out somewhere between aborting a fetus is exactly the same as clipping a fingernail on the one hand. It has no moral implications at all. It should have zero regulation. Or on the other hand, it should absolutely never be allowed. And anyone who does it is a murderer and you should punish the doctor. And by the way, also the woman because she, um, she contracted out a hit on, on a human being. It's, it's got to be in between there. And I think... We will work our way towards something close to a consensus, and and if we do this right, it can be that can be a, it won't be a rational conclusion because in the end it will require judgments, but it can be a rational process, and that's the value of what guys like you are doing. It's skeptic, right? You're forcing us into these rational grooves, which will help. Uh, one of the pushbacks I get uh, when I make the following kind of argument that. Um, 
you know, would you rather live in a democracy or an autocracy? Would you rather live in North Korea or South Korea or East Germany versus West Germany during the Cold War? You know, everybody, you know, who's not living under one of those regimes where they're forced to give a certain answer will say, well, of course, I want more freedom. I want to have a say in, in the democratic process and so on. Okay, so why do people want to be freer? So there you're getting to the constitution of human nature. You know, it's in our nature to want to have autonomy and, and choice and, and, and more freedom and so on. I'd rather not be slaved, enslaved. I'd rather be free. I'd rather have food than be hungry. You know, it's as basic as that. Now, the pushback I get is that that's still a subjective human value. It's a Western tradition value or, or something like that. It, you, you're still deriving an ought just from another ought. You're just saying that slavery is bad. Maybe some other culture, it's okay, and, and, and so forth. That That's kind of the, the pushback I get. Ultimately, you're not discovering anything. These values are all made up. Yeah, I think that's, in fact, empirically wrong, because I think very few human, human beings would trade the environment we have now for one where, for example, the bubonic plague killed, killed a third of Europe. Um. But, you know, if someone wants to say that, that's fine. If someone wants to try to make a case that, you know, we're better off before we had modern medicine, for example, or before all human beings were, were seen as dignified creatures, or before we had freedom and all governments were authoritarian and, and capricious, uh, when violence was two, three orders of magnitude higher than... I mean, if someone wants to claim that, they're, they're welcome to do that. But, you know... Do you think they'll really be taken seriously? Do we really want to spend a lot of time with that? I'd, I'd kind of rather meet people where they are and say, look, if you care about peace and freedom and knowledge, the big three that we get from the Constitution of Knowledge, if you don't care about those things, you know, if you're a sociopath, God bless you. But if you're one of the people who do care, there's, there's a much surer way to get those things than any other way. And that's this liberal system that we have this reality-based community. I love that phrase. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the community we should all live in. <laughs> uh, so while I, well, yeah, well, yeah, I filched it from Karl Rove. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't check your references in the book to see where that came from. All right. Well, whatever. <laughs> but while I've got you... I so, put it to so, good so use. Other hard problems that, that I think about that I'm not sure I know the answers to, but like say something like polygamy. Why, why do we have legal... Uh, restrictions against polygamy. What's wrong with polygamy? Or uh, prostitution, or uh, wearing in a different culture, women have to wear the burqa. Uh, you know, isn't it? Aren't these just Western or non Western traditions? Aren't these just cultural relative uh, phases we're going through? It could go some other way another time. Or do you think there's some something inherent in the laws we've developed or, or customs uh, along those lines? Well, same answer. If you want peace, freedom, and knowledge, there's only one way to get it. None of the other ways to organize politics or knowledge um, lead to that. So at some point, you just have to decide whether, you know, the system that put that shot in my arm that's allowed me to, uh, to go around without cowering in fear of the epidemic, you kind of have to decide if you value that, right? Because there's only one way to get there. Um, all the questions that you just asked, I think, have answers. Um, and those answers have been worked out to greater and lesser extents by the reality-based community using the rules and norms we're talking about. It's possible to approach them more or less rationally. But, you know, if, if someone wants to say, look, I, I, don't, I don't care if people live or die. I don't care if people are free or oppressed. Um, you know, then, then I kind of have to write that person off. I mean, what else do you say to that? Um, and usually, you know, if it's a university professor making a six-figure salary saying that, then I just assume, well, they're, they're being provocative because it's their job, and that's valuable because it keeps the rest of us honest. But if you look at the way they're actually raising their kids, they're probably not sociopaths. Yeah, but on those particular examples, say, for, for example, the prohibition against polygamy, and prostitution is because it, historically they've hurt women. And so we're trying to move in the direction of, of empowering all groups to have autonomy and choice and freedom. And let's say on the polygamy example, these young girls that are raised in these um, polygamous fund, uh, fundamentalist Mormon families, 
they have no idea what it's like to have choice. They they just know no, nothing different. So here, kind of an anti-libertarian position, maybe the state needs to come in and say, you're not going to do that to these children uh, because that's a form of child abuse, so, something like that. Or in case of prostitution, you know, sex workers, it seems like they should be free to do what they want their adults. But in fact, a lot of them are badly abused by their pimps and and uh and drug abused and and and, and, and poor they have no other options so yeah like yeah so so i have a lot to say about polygamy because i was one of the leading advocates of same-sex marriage and constantly pointed out that polygamy is one of the worst policy ideas ever because when one man marries two wives which is how polygamy works generally it's one man many wives then some other man marries no wife and that leads very quickly to unbalanced and dangerous social consequences. And we see that in places like China right now, where there's shortages of um, there are men who can't get married because of differential infanticide. Anyway, the bigger point is when I listen to the way Michael Shermer discusses this just now, possibly even without really thinking about it, He's going through some rational, debatable steps in his mind, each of which could be taken and analyzed and subjected to criticism by others. That's policy debate, right? That's policy discussion. That whole way of approaching the problem assumes that there are more and less rational ways and more or less communicable, adjudicable ways to come at these questions. Because you could have just said, well, God came to me in a dream and told me that polygamy is wrong and anyone who engages in it should be executed. You didn't use that style of argument, and that's the constitution of knowledge. You're thinking about this in a way which exposes you to criticism and empirical correction from me and anyone else who encounters the steps that you've taken. That's, the t that's where the magic is happening. It's not that you automatically get the right or wrong conclusion. It's that you have exposed yourself and your ideas to this global process that allow others to weigh in, and that's where the magic happens. And you're not even thinking about it. <laughs> That's right, yeah. No, and you would include the people that would debunk yeah. me or show me that I'm wrong, and there's plenty of them that write me that say, no, 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 that argument Yeah, we'll fun. have a debate about they, polygamy. They, we'll have a debate to, about they prostitution. To, they get to participate in the Constitution of Knowledge. Here's how you put it. I really like this. Now you must have noticed that a phrase I used a few paragraphs ago, validated in some way, hides a cheek. In epistemology, the whole question is validated in what way? As we have seen, the epistemic and social consequences of validation using, say, a tribal oracle versus an authoritarian government versus social error seeking are different, and the systems are in many ways incompatible with each other. If we care about knowledge, freedom, and peace, then we need to stake a strong claim. Anyone can believe anything but liberal science, open ended, depersonalized, checking by error seeking social network is the only legitimate validator of knowledge at least in the reality-based community. Anyway, you put that so well, I just wanted to read that. Okay, now I'm going to do the whatabouts. Uh, okay, what about uh, fraud, libel, perjury, blackmail, espionage? I mean, how far do you take free speech and, and this constitution of knowledge to allow people to do and say whatever they want? Well, first thing to remember is I'm not just defending free speech, though I certainly do. I'm defending a system, actually, of rules and regulations social rules and regulations, not government rules and regulations, that determine what, we, what goes in the textbooks, for example, what counts as knowledge, what doesn't. Uh, on the free speech question, uh, I think the American Supreme Court jurisprudence has it about right. There are certain well-established, carved out, narrow, and stable categories that are uh, not First Amendment protected, and they include all of the things that you just cited and a few others. And that's fine. Those are well-established exceptions, and there are good rules for them, and they don't, when they're well-administered, they don't interfere with the reality-based community. Um, but they're fairly narrow exceptions, and, uh, and that's, that's exactly how we should view them. Not grounds that we need to relitigate. And it doesn't lead to the logical, the illogical, the fallacious conclusion that, well, if you make some ex exceptions from anybody can say anything ever, then you can have no boundaries at all. We know you can have boundaries because we've had boundaries now for many, many decades, and they've worked. So the adversarial system used in courts is itself another form of this constitution of knowledge 
because you get both sides fighting for their position, and then the judge or jury makes a decision based on that. Yes, and they're fact-based. They can't just make stuff up. They have to cite evidence. They have to show their reasoning. They have to do all the same sorts of things that other members of the reality-based community have to do. So, yeah, that's right. Right. Okay, let me, let me read uh, to our audience Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes' uh, decision in the 1919 case of Schenck versus the United States, which you're very familiar with, uh, with these famous phrases that can then lead us to the concept of hate speech and inciting violence and so forth that are popular now. So this is a century ago. This has now come back up. So he writes, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. It is a question of proximity and degree. Right? So what were these clear and present dangers? These were flyers uh, distributed by Charles Shank, the head of the Socialist Party in Philadelphia, warning um, draft-age men that uh, you know, conscription into the Army is, is a violation of their constitutional rights. And for this, he was, you know, jailed and, and, and so forth. Well, so we're kind of seeing this again now that, you know, that speech like that is can be harmful to people. Uh, and therefore, it should be censored or, you know, canceled or something like that. So how do you think about, uh, the, you know, those those kind of uh, you know, gray areas of there? To, to what extent speech can lead to violence? Maybe, maybe even take Trump, given the speech on the morning of January 6th, and, you know, two hours later, there's the storming of the Capitol. A lot of people said, that's Trump's fault. He caused that through his speech. So how, how do you think about that? Um, I think you have to be extremely careful, as the courts have been, with all due respect to Mr. Justice Holmes. You have to be extremely careful. Um, and if you're going to have a doctrine that, that talks about imminent harm and imminent danger, you have to do what the courts have done since the time of Justice Holmes, which was require a very, very tight nexus between the speech and the harm. It can't be two hours later. Um, there's a, I, I don't think you could get a conviction from President Trump for sedition based on the speech that he gave that morning, and I don't think we see sedition trials partly for that reason. Um, so... The exception there is so narrow that it really only obtains in cases where, for example, you have a mob that is poised to lynch someone and someone is standing there saying, kill him. That would probably cross the line. But it really has to be that close, and I agree with that principle. And the reason for that is that lots of people have radical ideas about, you know, whether the government is legitimate, whether it should be overthrown. There's a book came out last year basically saying riots and property damage are okay because that's the way you get social change down through history. Well, I disagree with that, but I'm sure not going to put that in jail, uh, that person in jail. That's an idea we should have to contend with. So I think the right answer to that is that it's very important to distinguish speech from violence. And in fact, without that distinction, you can't have free speech. Because if you say that, for instance, my saying something that you, you deem to be offensive is the equivalent of an act of violence against you, then my criticizing you becomes a human rights violation. And you can't have science, because science is all about people criticizing each other and their ideas in often a very rough way. Okay, so let's talk about what happened in the last 25 years. I mean, we're, again, yeah. we're old enough to know, remember, it was conservatives that were uh, harping about uh, dangerous speech and rock lyrics and uh, burning the flag and Madonna's videos. And again, I always reference Frank, one of my favorite debates, Frank Zappa is on, I think it was Crossfire, CNN's Crossfire with some senator, you know, who was, who was uh, railing about Zappa's own rock lyrics. And he's like, they're just words, Senator. You need to get out more. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> but but again, Sorry, I missed that. now you turn on Fox News. It, oh, yeah, no, it's great. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. He's just so good. Now you turn on Fox News and see Hannity and, and Carlson and these in this crew defending free speech. And, and, and it's the liberals going crazy about 
uh, you know, hate speech and dangerous speech, and we need to, you know, silence people and so on. So what happened? Well, I think it's actually not all that complicated. I'd be curious to get your take. <clears throat> but free speech has fair weather friends. Um, maybe I should say foul weather friends, because historically the people who need free speech are the people who are in the minority, the people who are socially vulnerable, people like, you know, gay people like me, who were deeply unpopular in society um, and had to use speech to make the case for equality, for example, in marriage. Free speech is never popular among majorities because they're the ones who get to decide, and it's never popular among the people who have the real power, you know, the governments and the dominant forces in society. So, when conservatives were in charge and able to read the riot act to anyone who was deemed to be a communist or a progressive, they did that because they had the power. When liberals had cultural power, progressives, I should say, when progressives had the cultural power, as they do now in the United States in the context of universities and increasingly journalism and media and Hollywood and lots of other places, when they have the power, the tables turn, right? Well, why should we tolerate this offensive and bigoted and dangerous stuff that these people want to say? And they're in a position to stop it. So the thing to remember here is that free speech is always the friend of the person who is socially marginalized and weak at any given moment. It means on a college campus where you've got overpowering numbers of progressives and only a few conservatives, for example, the conservatives are going to say, we need free speech. And the progressives are going to say, well, we'd rather not give it to you. <laughs> right. Yeah, so it does come down to power, uh, which is what, you know, one of the points that, that, that uh, progressives make, that, you know, it's much of a power struggle between the oppressed and the oppressors. You know, well, um, they're, they're sort of maybe uh, an example of that. Yes, uh, it's not all about power. I should say that it's these people aren't being on either side. They're they're not being cynical. Um, so here's something that I say a lot because it's it's so important, which is we need to understand that the idea that speech, which is blasphemous, heretical, bigoted, offensive, wrongheaded, that speech like that should not only be tolerated, but protected. This is the single most counterintuitive social idea of all time. I mean, it's just crazy. It's not how we're wired as humans. Really? Stuff that is bigoted, wrong, offensive, blasphemous, heretical, and seditious should be protected by the government? The only justification for that completely bonkers idea is that it's also the single most successful social idea of all time. It is the key to our ability to live together in a diverse society, to find knowledge by comparing diverse, point of view, diverse points of view, to find the errors that we make, which other people who we think are biased will point out. It's the only way that you put an end to the, the creed wars over reality. It does all that, but because the idea of free speech is so counterintuitive, you and I and your children and their children and their children all the way down will have to get up every morning for the rest of time and justify this crazy social principle all over from scratch. They will. And we just need to be cheerful about that. Because I, I, I hope they will, but we just need to be cheerful about that because by historic standards and international standards, we're doing incredibly well. My interpretation of this is, and uh, in, in, in employing the principle of charitable uh, interpretation of people that is given the benefit of the doubt that their motives are good, you know, political correctness, uh, starting with uh, the change of language, was important. I mean, you know, women first pointed this out, uh, how men talk about women or, or, you know, Jews point out how people talk about the language they use to describe Jews or blacks or whatever. Uh, my favorite example is, you know, Richard Dawkins makes this point that you can identify the decade a novel was written in in the last 200 years or so based on the language they used to describe Jews and blacks and women and gays and so on. And that all changed. And, you know, his point was not from the top down. No one passed a law saying you can't use this word anymore. 
you know, we all had our consciousnesses raised, our moral sphere increased to include more of those people as honorary members of our family, our group, our tribe, and so on. And you just don't talk about your fellow tribe members in derogatory language. So we change the language, you know, and then and then it kind of trickles up from pop culture films and TV scripts and novels and comic books and just the way you and I talk, you know, at the at the at the restaurant over dinner or whatever and 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 it just kind of gradually shifts slowly enough you don't really notice it until you look back you know decades later it's like that interview that john wayne gave where he talked about indians and blacks and he but he didn't use those words like oh my god it's just painful to see this and yet no one made that happen it just sort of happened so there's a logic to uh yes we should be concerned about words that people use starting with the n-word i'm not going to use it you're not going to use it. Okay, fine. That's taboo. Uh, but but from there, you know, what about other words? And, uh, you know, the language game is hard to keep up with in the progressive woke community. I'm not very woke, I guess, because I have, I have to look stuff up all the time to even understand what I'm reading. Uh, you know, so, but once you set up that category, that, then the bin gets larger and larger of words that become taboo. And all of a sudden, we're all walking around on pins and needles afraid to say anything because you might use the wrong word and then the wrong sentence and then the wrong opinion. And all of a sudden, you're silencing yourself. Yeah, I don't think that taboos are helpful, Michael. I think, in fact, they're probably counterproductive because people go around thinking because they've they put a taboo on what we now call the n-word we've actually helped someone with a real world problem like discriminatory policing or now i see people want to say f-word for fag and i'm like please i'm gay don't be condescending i am i am not i don't need these protections i don't need these taboos i won't faint you don't need to get me smelling salts if you use these words because we understand that there is a problem with hate and with hate speech. But the problem with hate speech isn't the speech, it's the hate. And that comes from fear and ignorance. And the way you correct the fear and ignorance is by countering and confronting the ideas. And the people who have them, and that means they need to speak and we need to speak. So putting taboos on this, chilling the conversation, that does not help solve the problem. In fact, what it probably does do is create the kinds of resentments about speech policing and thought policing that get Donald Trump elected. So I am, I am actually not a fan of this notion of placing taboos on words and doing a lot of speech policing. I think it's backfiring, and I think it's basically hostile to the place real progress of the kind you mentioned came from. We talked about this earlier, women and gays and, and anti-racism. That comes from the moral dialogue, which which takes time, but it does need to happen. <laughs> right. As I like to say, the, my, my campaign, campaign slogan of, uh, you know, what do we want? Slow, gradual, incremental, peaceful change. When do we want it? Eventually. <laughs> you know, no one's going to come, uh, you know, march with me downtown. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah, though it, it's ama amazingly fast. You know, I, I remember as if yesterday in 1995, my father warning me not to become an advocate, a public advocate of same-sex marriage. Because he said, he, was, he had nothing, he knew I was gay and he had no problems with that, but he said that it would destroy my reputation as a journalist because this was such a crazy idea that no one would take me seriously. And at the time, that was a very real argument. You know, this was such an eccentric thing to talk about. And 20 years later, it's nationally legal, uh, 2015, and not even very controversial. We did that through moral conversation. We did that by holding up the views of our opponents and saying things like, wait a minute, okay, show me, how does my marriage harm your marriage? Um, they couldn't answer these questions. So that's, this works, and in fact, it works incredibly quickly by historians. Yeah, I remember. You know, maybe not tomorrow, but... I remember being on a bike ride with one of my conservative buddies in the 90s who was very anti-gay and anti-gay marriage. And he was, going, you know, they just, it's the lifestyle thing. They want to convert people to their lifestyle. So I said, you mean if, like, you got talked to by a gay or something, you, you switch teams? He goes, well, no, of course not. It's like, 
Right. So what is it you're worried about? <laughs> I mean, how is this going to happen? What's the what's well, the children? It's like, yeah, how, how's that going to happen? I mean, would your kids turn gay if they? No, my kids wouldn't. Right. So what are we talking about here? Anyway, were you surprised by how fast uh, this uh, rights revolution came about compared to, say, women's rights and then civil rights and, and abolition of slavery going back? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I thought when I became the public advocate of, of gay marriage, or as we gay people call it, marriage. marriage. <laughs> um, in, in 1995 and 1996, I thought if we were lucky, we were talking about two generations out. Mm. I, I never imagined it could happen so quickly. And, and each one happens faster than the one before. Because they build on each other. And they, that's moral they learning. They use the same arguments. And they, they build on each other. But, but you have to have an environment where these arguments can happen. If you're in an environment that's, that's chilled or intimidated, or an entire side refuses or, or is, is reluctant to raise its, its qualms, because it fears it will be canceled or sanctioned, lose their job, lose their livelihood. If you have that kind of chilled debate, you'll get a distorted outcome and you won't get moral progress. What you'll in fact get is a lot of chilling, a deeply divided society and a lot of people reacting, uh, voting again for people like Trump. You, the only way out is through, something we learned in the, in the gay debate. You just have to go through the process of making your case and making your converts. Yeah, again, some of my uh, conservative friends, one of the things they liked about Trump, probably the number one thing I would hear when I'd say, why are you voting for Trump? He stands up to the, you know, the PC police, the language, the police, the cancel culture. You know, he stands up against the snowflakes. He, he says things that I wish I could say at work, but I got to keep my mouth shut. And political science, the evidence supports that. Yeah, these heavy-handed canceling tactics, they are not persuading the people who most need to be persuaded. You talked about pluralistic ignorance and the spiral of silence in, uh, in your new book. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent people believe that everybody else believes it, or if they know that uh, most people don't believe it, but there's a, a, a powerful enough minority that they got to keep their mouth shut anyway. If you see what I'm asking there, how, you know, how powerful a force is spiral of silence versus just in so, sort of self-censorship because of fear. Uh, is there a difference? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I don't, I don't know that we ever really know, but let me, let me address that. If I, if I may, Michael, by just backing up a little bit and, and talking about the second half of the book. So the first half lays out basically the idea that it's not just a marketplace of ideas, it's a constitution of knowledge. The second half is you're being manipulated, and it's about the tactics that are being used to undermine this impersonal process of social discovery, social learning. And one of those goes by a name that didn't even exist when I started writing the book, which is cancel culture. But I called it um, coercive conformity. Nothing new about it goes back to forever. Alexis de Tocqueville came to America in 1835 and said it was the biggest threat to freedom, that if you, if you were out of tune with majority opinion, um, you, you would lose your career, everyone would turn their back on you, your place in society, so you learn to stay quiet and chilled. What Tocqueville didn't know, but what you alluded to just now, is that minorities can do exactly the same thing simply by being more outspoken, by being organized and focused so that when they see someone who's a dissenter against whatever it is that the minority wants to promulgate, they swat them down. They can go to the employer and say, do you really want to keep this racist on the payroll? They can go to the friends and say, you're friends with this person? Well, then maybe you're a racist too. They can uh, deprive them of their reputation by ganging up on Twitter, calling them a racist or a homophobe or whatever it is. So it doesn't really take that many people engaging in this kind of organized campaign for the rest of us to say, well, it's not really worth it. You know, we, didn't, we can live without having these conversations. Um, so it turns out that actually fairly small numbers of people can impose what's called, again, as you alluded to, a, what's called a spiral of silence. And that's a chilled environment 
where people are falsifying their preferences because one whole side is chilled and repressed because they don't want to get into this kind of social trouble. They figure it's just better to stay quiet. But then no one knows what anyone else is really thinking. You can have many people who believe X but aren't saying X. They're saying Y. Well, that has two effects. One is just that it chills the conversation because a lot of people are afraid to speak out, and that's the case today. 60% of Americans and 67% of college students say that they're afraid to state their real positions on political issues for fear of being, uh, uh, being swatted down for fear of being ostracized or disapproved of. That's a huge number. It's one study finds approximately four times higher than the chilling effect at the height of the McCarthy era. But there's also this secondary thing that happens, which is even more subtle and twisted and weird and nasty, which is humans are consensus detectors. We go around sensing what do the other people in my social environment believe. That's how we decide what's acceptable not only to say, but to actually believe. Well, if you can game that, if you can create a false appearance of consensus that everyone believes X, just because everyone is in the same bubble of not being willing to say Y, that actually changes what people really believe. It changes what they perceive. This has been shown by psychologists. This is why the Soviet Union was so determined to silence people like Andrei Sakharov, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Andrei Omalrik, these dissidents, small individual voices, well, maybe, but they had the power to notify everyone else, wait a minute, there's another point of view in the room. That breaks the power, the spiral of silence. And that's why you see these, these, these coercers, these harassed cancelers, let's call them, why they can go to such great lengths to take punitive measures against anyone who they perceive steps out of line, or sometimes someone who does nothing at all in particular, but just to demonstrate that they can drop the hammer at will. This is very sophisticated stuff. These are powerful propaganda tactics. And they're hard to counter. But the first step is to understand what's going on. It's like those videos of the North Korean citizens uh, weeping uncontrollably at the death of the dear leader, Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's like, does anybody really believe that these are real tears? <laughs> I mean, everybody believes that everybody else so, believes so that. So using these, <laughs> exactly, and, and not even they really know. These tactics can cause so much disorientation around public and private belief that people can lose their sense of their personal boundaries of belief. Yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. Well, so um, let's talk about the, you know, kind of the uh, up to current times. I was thinking about when I was reading Constitution of Knowledge, the people and groups I've investigated over the decades were at least operating within the constitution of knowledge. I mean, even the flat earthers have arguments. The creationists have links of arguments. Even the Holocaust deniers gave me a list when I investigated them, met them. I said, what are your arguments? They gave me a, a, a mimeograph sheet. Like, here's the 39 arguments that we think show that the Holocaust didn't happen. Like, you know, and then you just go through them one, one by one. But you know, with Trump and, you know, and, and Bannon, because you talk about Bannon, there, there, there doesn't seem to be any sense of like, well, we got to make an argument, you know, in terms of conspiracy theories. Again, JFK people, uh, you know, they have lots of arguments. You know, Trump's is just the conspiracy theory without the theory. It's just this is what's happening because I say so. So this is what you're saying is different from all other, you know, Nixon type uh, arguments and, and line and dissembling and so on. It's different now. It's different. It's not new, but it's different. So uh, I worry a lot about what we just talked about, which is canceling spirals of silence, the use of social coercion to mute an entire side of the debate. Um, but I worry even more about something very new in America, which is the adaptation and application of Russian-style disinformation tactics to American politics, something we have never seen before, something we thought was not possible in America. These are very sophisticated propaganda tools. They go back to Lenin, to Hitler. Goebbels was a master at this stuff. They've been used by and refined by Russians for years. Vladimir Putin is a master. Donald Trump, I believe, is the greatest disinformation warrior since the 1930s because he figured out how to do this stuff 
in America and apply it to politics. So what is the stuff we're talking about? There's a few things that he's doing. The first is what students of Russian disinformation call the fire hose of falsehood. And that's where you spew out so, many, so much intellectual garbage, so many conspiracy theories, lies, sometimes half-truths, sometimes you throw in a truth just to keep people guessing. But you throw so much of it out there so quickly that people can't possibly keep up. The media can't fact-check it fast enough. There's so many inconsistencies that people get completely confused. Peter Pomerantsev, who's a student of Russian disinformation, calls this the carnivalesque quality of this type of propaganda. It takes an almost perverse joy in a sheer volume of stuff. So this is what we saw, for example, in Stop the Steal. Dozens and dozens of conspiracy theories, outlandish, inconsistent with each other, but if you tried to knock one down, five more would take its place. And in the process of knocking one of them down, you would repeat it, and it turns out psychologists understand that just repeating something, even to refute it, can embed it in people's brains. That's why these techniques are so difficult to counter. They're very sophisticated, and actually in a democracy like ours, the only real protection against them is not to use them to begin with. So Donald Trump blows through that. He does it in the 2016 campaign. By October, political, politi PolitiFact, excuse me, which is checking Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump is finding that 75% of what Clinton says is true or mostly true. 70% of what Trump says is false or mostly false. Now, you know, think, think about that for a minute. Let, let that sink in. A presidential candidate, most of what he's saying that's checkable is false or mostly false. Then he gets into office. The first thing he does is lie about whether it rained during his inauguration and lie about the size of the crowd things that are so blatant that he can't be trying to persuade anybody. Instead, Putin-like, he's claiming sovereignty over reality, saying random stuff to confuse people, and just saying, you're never going to be oriented about truth anymore. And then he does stuff like change a weather map. He draws a Sharpie on a, on a hurricane map in full public view. It's, well, no, it's not hilarious. I wish it were hilarious. It's obvious, but remember, this kind of propaganda works in full public view. It's about creating disorientation and confusion. So people become cynical. They throw up their hands. I don't know what to believe anymore. Is it the fake news media? What about the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration? Well, the president says they're wrong. And the president says all kinds of things and they contradict. Who do I believe? People start to say, and we started to see that, I don't know who to believe anymore. I don't trust anyone anymore. That's what Vladimir Putin is going for. His demagogues can step into that void and say, well, why don't you trust me? That's the space they can use to create the cult of personality. That's what Putin is up to. It's what Trump is up to. The big payoff starts in April of 2020. It starts with the attack on mail-in voting. You know, a lot of pundits in Washington, people like me, you know, well, that doesn't really make sense because a lot of Trump voters use mail balloting. So, you know, this might backfire on, on Election Day. What we didn't realize is that he wasn't planning for Election Day. He was looking at the post-election. He understood he was likely to lose. And what he was doing was organizing and preparing a disinformation network the likes of which the country had never seen before. So that the day after the election, he's got them prepared. So... He launches the big lie that he won the election. The day after the election, he blasts it out through conservative media, talk radio, cable news, through the White House. He uses Republican mouthpieces. Um, he even uses the courts. He files multiple frivolous lawsuits based on conspiracy theories that the courts basically throw out instantly because they're nutty. But again, that's not the point. It's not to win the case. It's to confuse the public. He's got every channel amplify the lie that he won the election, and now 70% of Republicans believe it. Um, in the view of a majority of Americans, we no longer live in a democracy. The presidency has been stolen. The election was rigged. Uh, we've never seen anything like this before, Michael. And what it shows us is that America is 
it's like a, a victim of COVID who's never been exposed before and is very vulnerable. We don't have defenses socially against this kind of disinformation because we've never needed them. And we better start thinking and adapting fast. Because this is now a feature of our politics going forward. Epistemic immune system, really. The phrase I use for what's going on here is epistemic warfare. Because it's about obliterating our ability as a society to tell reality from fiction. What you're describing, in a way, is a conspiracy. Not, not a conspiracy theory, that Trump and his cronies conspired to do everything you just described. Yeah, I don't know about conspired. I just think they're, they're very smart about disinformation. You know, Steve Bannon, who you mentioned earlier, who is a senior advisor to Trump, famously said, told this to a reporter, Michael Lewis, it's no secret what they're doing. He just said, well, the enemy is, the real enemy is the media, and we know how to deal with them. We just flood the zone with shit. Here's what you wrote. This is classic disinformation. Yeah, this is so tactic. good, you write here. Uh, Trump, you know. You write here in a famous remark to the journalist Michael Lewis in 2018. Steve Bannon, the Breitbart News chairman who went on to become a senior strategist for candidate Trump and then President Trump, said, the Democrats don't matter. The real opposition is the media. And the way to deal with them is to flood the zone with shit. And then you repeat it, flood the zone with shit. Although the formulation is crude, there could be no more concise and accurate summation of what modern information warfare is all about. All communities, and especially the reality-based community, rely on networks of trust to decide what is and is not true. People need to know whom they are talking to, whether that person is credible, which institutions confer credibility, and so on. Every aspect of trust and credibility is degraded when the zone is flooded with shit. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do wonder to what extent, you know, yeah, Republicans... Yeah, way better than censorship. The Republicans who tick the box for, yeah, I think there's something to the QAnon conspiracy theory or the rigged election conspiracy. Do they really believe that there's a secret satanic cult of pedophiles uh, drinking the blood of children in a pizzeria in Washington, D.C.? Or are they just ticking the box because, well, this is my team. I just agree with whatever the team says is true. Uh, I probably don't actually you know, believe that in, in, in reality. I think the evidence is that it's some of both, and it's hard to distinguish. Some people really believe this stuff. We know one guy believed it enough to show up yeah. at a pizzeria with right, a with rifle a and actually yeah. fire a shot and go looking for the children, the, the, the child sex slaves that were in the basement. Uh, that particular pizzeria does not have a basement, but never <laughs> mind. Right. So some people believe it, but for a lot of people, it has more to do with um, being feeling like they're part of a, of a social network where you have privileged special knowledge that other people don't have access to. And for a lot of people, there's a kind of gamified aspect to it, you know, finding traces of stuff, clues, almost like pursuing clues in a video game. Um, and for a lot of people, it's just about finding friends online. Yeah, well, yeah, really, it's a community. True, it's entertaining. And so it's, so it's complicated, but the point I try to make to people is, you know, we don't really have to sort that out. To know that the effect of this stuff, when mobilized by a major political party and a president of the United States, is deeply it is inconsistent with democracy. Well, so what I'm thinking, like, if you sat down one on one uh, at, at dinner with Ted Cruz and you laid out the QAnon conspiracy like I did, just did, and you said, Ted, do you actually believe this? He's got to say, well, no, of course not. You know, I know we know we all know this is bullshit, but we want we're just trying to win. This game is to win. If you're not in office, you've lost. So whatever it takes in a kind of a, a Machiavellian way to get into office, lie, whatever. This is this is how politics works. Kids grow up, get tough. Too bad. This is this is the game. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think Trump looks at it that way. I think he views anything that comes out of his mouth or the mouth of any of his allies is purely instrumental. Could be true, could be false, could be in between, doesn't matter if it advances. His interests cause more confusion, disorientation, um, and owns the libs. <laughs> but yeah. for people like who are, who are more connect, who are, who are less cynical than that, there's this other thing that goes on called conspiracy bootstrapping. And that's when you float a rumor 
a conspiracy theory or some type of lie or misinformation. And then people start picking it up and it starts to circulate. And then you say, and you convince yourself you can say this in good conscience, well, a lot of pe people believe this thing. So shouldn't it at least be investigated? Now, as someone at the skeptic knows, one of the critical tools that science has to keep society rational is all the things it does not bother to investigate. Um, it does not investigate whether we have um, fillings in our teeth that are rebroadcasting alien messages that take over our brains. That would be a waste of time. And what you do with these false beliefs is you marginalize them. You just let them die out. No one acquires them. No one cares about them. But if conspiracy theorists can float all this stuff and get everyone else to chase it and get the media to, be, uh, to, to focus on it and then use that focus to further amplify through the population, you get an upward spiral of disinformation. And they can do that. And that's what's going on in Arizona right now with the so-called audit, the so-called recount. Some people had some conspiracy theories about the election. And some other people said, well, that should be investigated. Maybe it's true that ballots were imported from China. Um, so they set up, they go and subpoena the ballots. They set up a so-called investigation, which is led by people who have zero experience doing election audits. The head of which has endorsed Trumpian conspiracy theories. And they set about looking for, I'm not making this up, looking for traces of bamboo filaments on the ballots in Maricopa County, Arizona. They don't need to find the traces. It doesn't matter. The point is that they've now set up this investigation, further elevating this conspiracy theory, and now leading to movements in other states around the country to do the same thing, all with no basis in fact. Yeah, what really surprised me on this particular conspiracy theory is Usually when somebody high up in the group says, no, there's nothing to this, the rank and file usually fall into place. So I figured after A.G. Barr came out and said, well, we Justice Department looked into it. There's nothing to it. And then, you know, even Mike Penn said, no, nah, there's nothing to it. I thought, well, that's it. You know, everybody's got to fall into line. But I guess because the top, top boss said, it, it, you know, it's rigged and I won, I guess the rank and file you know, are following him and not the normal channels of, trust and reliability like the head of the Department of Justice and the vice president. Or the Maricopa County recorder who is a Republican who calls the investigation a sham. Or the, the five Maricopa County supervisors, four of whom are Republicans, who have all called the investigation a sham, called for it to end, said it's a lie. Remember, people are, one of the reasons these tactics work is that it is so much more gratifying for us as individuals to have someone come along and tell us a story that says, you know, you're right all along. You didn't lose that election. Some bad people did this to you. That's very appealing to us as humans. You know, we're wired to think, you know, someone hurt our tribe, someone hurt our group. We didn't really lose. We didn't fail. So people cooperate this. They're looking for this. This is demand pull, not just supply push. And so all it takes is a demagogue to come along and say, yeah, you're right. You guys won this election. These bad people did it to you. They work off each other. Um, that's why you need a constitution of knowledge. It's a system that has a lot of rules and disciplines and intermediaries to protect us from ourselves. Another debate I'm, I'm conflicted about is to what extent social media has driven this. You cite some uh, research by uh, Andrew Guest, Brendan Nan, and Jason Reifler in 2018 found that fewer than half of Americans visited a fake news website in the weeks before the 2016 election, but the visitors were not evenly distributed across the ideological spectrum. About six in 10 visits to fake news sites came from the most conservative 20% of Americans. Trump supporters were more than twice as likely as Hillary Clinton supporters to visit untrustworthy websites. Strikingly, fake news sites accounted for more than 10% of Trump supporters' overall news diet versus only 1% of Clinton supporters' news diets. Other research found that conservatives were more exposed to conspiracy theories and fake news and were more likely to believe them. Now, um, I had on the, the podcast, um, oh, shoot, uh, the, the guy who wrote the book, Not Born Yesterday, Hugo Mercier, 
And he makes the argument, he cites the same st studies, but he says, yeah, but those people were already going to vote for Trump anyway. So the social media bubbles that we're in are not converting people to the other side. They're just reinforcing the team uh, dogma. And that's, you know, nothing unusual there. So he's arguing that the, that the social media probably did not account for Trump's victory over uh, Hillary. That's probably right. Um, the, the trouble there is failing to understand the game that this type of epistemic warfare is playing for. Remember, they're not necessarily trying to change people's minds to inspire action. They're happy if that happens. But what they're really out to do with this style of disinformation is to confuse people so that they can't make up their minds and they become demoralized. So their resistance to the cult of personality drops. So what fake news probably doesn't do very often is turn a Hillary Clinton voter into a Donald Trump voter. But what it probably can do is take a Donald Trump voter and confuse them, send them down a rabbit hole, persuade them that they are the victims of a conspiracy, persuade them that Democrats are evil, and persuade them that they should believe Donald Trump rather than the evidence of their own eyes on election day. That's what you're out to do. It's the confusion. Nihan also cites evidence from an interesting study, very plausible if you think about it, looking at the effects of fake stories on people using survey data and finding that actually only fairly small minorities were actually persuaded of these theories, but two, three, four times as many people weren't persuaded, but decided they didn't know who was right or who was wrong in these situations. Like Pizzagate, is there a conspiracy of Democrats and liberals and President Obama to kidnap children and sex traffic them, led by Hillary Clinton? Well, I'm really not sure anymore. Because, you know, I hear it from all these people. It might be true. Well, that's what they're going for. It's that confusion and disorientation. And they're very good at that. Yeah, there is research in conspiracy uh, cognition that people who tick the box for one conspiracy are more likely to tick the box for a whole bunch. The famous paper on this is called uh, Dead and Alive. People who tick the box for saying that uh, Princess Diana was probably murdered are also more likely to tick the box that she faked her death and she's living... South America or whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know, so it's, it's kind of a proxy for other beliefs. So I think what you're arguing is that by going down the rabbit hole of one crazy idea, it kind of opens up your cognition to being open to these other things that may come down the pipe. We don't even know what the future conspiracy theories are going to be, but we know you're going to be more susceptible if you're in our bubble and we're feeding you this bullshit. Yeah, what it's all about is my definition of this type of disinformation of propaganda is what you're out to do is organize and manipulate the social and media environments in order to dominate, divide, and disorient your political opponents. And that is clearly working today uh, when you've got 70 percent of Republicans who believe that Donald Trump won the election and many other people who think we'll never know. It was working when I, I quote a senator, John Neely Kennedy, Louisiana, in my book saying, well, we'll never know who was behind the uh, election interference of 2016. We'll never know if it was Russia or Ukraine. Well, in fact, we do know it was Russia. It was not Ukraine. But the propaganda talking point was maybe it was Ukraine. We'll never know. If you're not sure, you can't act. Demobil demoralization is demobilization, and that's what they're out to oh, do. Oh, yeah, that's a great phrase. Yeah, that's good. All right, let's wrap up by talking about what we can do about it. Everything from institutional changes to, you know, I'm at dinner with, you know, crazy Uncle Fred, and he says, you know, by the way, Trump won that election. What do I say? What does anybody say to somebody like that? Or what can our institutions do to kind of bolster the, the constitution of knowledge? Well, it's a long road back. Our society is not wired to cope with instant draggings and dogpiles on social media. Never had to deal with that before. Our society, our politics are clearly not wired to deal with massive 
information warfare, warfare campaigns, fire hose of falsehood campaigns being run by a president of the United States and his political party against the people of the United States. There's no precedent for that. Never even conceived that it was possible. So we don't yet know exactly how to get out of this, and I'm not sure that we can, but here's why I'm optimistic. The first thing that has to happen is people need to start understanding what's going on, that they're being manipulated and that these are powerful tools of disinformation. It is harder to manipulate a population that understands people are trying to manipulate it. Well, I hope people will read my book, and books by people like Pomerantsev and others. And I think that's starting to happen. I think people are starting to figure out that these tactics are out there. Um, and I think more of that will happen. Media needs to get smarter. And it has did a far better job in 2020 of resisting Russian-style disinformation than it did in 2016 when it basically reported on it in a kind of naive way. Now you've got people covering disinformation. They've got better provision of context on stuff like Hunter Biden's hard drive. Looked like a classic Soviet disinformation drop, actually. You know, hard drive materializes out of nowhere. Blind repairman isn't sure who dropped it off. No chain of custody, you know, it's crazy stuff like that. Um, people are getting much more sophisticated in the academic world. You now have research centers at places like Stanford and Harvard and many foreign countries tracking disinformation networks. You've got citizen activists going inside those networks to discover the next conspiracy theory and get to it early so they can uh, notify social media companies. Social media companies have started to figure out that their business model, although it's based on collecting eyeballs, that if they become a basically a sewage pipe of disinformation, that uh, they will lose not only public support, but their business will become unattractive. That's, that's a very hostile environment to humans. And they're starting to figure out and innovate, can they make their platforms more truth-friendly? Some of that will be policy changes, you know, like, Facebook and Twitter changing who can post what when. But the bigger change is going to be changes in the way the platforms actually work and the product design. And we're seeing that already at places like Twitter and Facebook, changes in the algorithms. Twitter now, when I try to retreat a, a link, and if I haven't actually clicked on it, I'm interrupted. I get a screen that pops up says, are you sure you want to click on this without reading it? So there's a lot of these in real-time experiments in behavioral psychology going on to try to help us understand better how to interrupt some of these cycles of transmission. Civic education, media literacy, evidence is that this kind of thing helps. Um, on the cancel culture side, it's very important, again, to understand what's going on. Employers have turned out to be the soft underbelly of cancel culture because employers are, you know, if Michael Shermer gets controversial, you know, I can hire someone to replace him, so I'll just fire him, let him go. Well, that becomes a real soft, soft underbelly. Um, we need to get employers to understand better why they need to support employees in this situation and not just fire them right away. Um, and we also need people to be a bit braver about speaking the truth, about pushing back. Too often the real snowflake is not the activist, the social activist, who's trying to improve the world by chilling speech. It's the person on the other end of that who decides, well, it's just easier to keep my head down and be quiet. Remember, they can't silence you if you don't let yourself be silenced. And if a lot of people don't let themselves be silenced, or even a few, it turns out, doesn't take all that many, you can break the spiral of silence dynamic. You can break the chilling effect. Other people see, well, okay, maybe it is okay to speak out. So I could go on, you get the idea, a difficulty with this book is there's not three bullet points of things that solve it. Historically, we have had these massive information disruptions before, including the invention of the printing press, the arrival of the penny press and then offset printing in the 19th century. And when we solve them, and we do typically, it's by making a host of individual and institutional adjustments right through society. It's an all of society approach. I think we're already starting to see that mobilization. I think people are already better at understanding the nature of epistemic warfare. But I also think we have a long way to go, which is why I'm so happy to appear on this show <laughs> yeah. and on other shows okay. like it. Yes, it's, uh, it's important what you're doing, and I do think there are examples of pushback. My favorite is Trader Joe's. 
you know, who got pushed back from the cancel culture that they should uh, they should cancel Trader Jose's, Trader Giotto's, and Trader Ming, I think it was, for their Chinese food, because uh, they're culturally appropriating. So the CEO issued a letter saying, well, we thought about all your points, and, uh, you know, we agree these are serious issues. We gave it a lot of consideration, and we're keeping our products just the way they are. Thank you very much. And the mob went away. They just said, okay. And guess what? Nothing terrible happened. Well, right. That's right. People greatly overestimate the power of these activists because they're very noisy. They're very good at focusing attention on themselves through social media. Uh, and it's just easier to assume, well, why would I want trouble with these people? But their power comes from being overestimated. Um, I think it was Jonathan Haidt, but someone I talked to made the interesting parallel to terrorists. They actually have very little hard power. They can cause something to go boom. But what they're really relying on is everyone else to project that through the media as, oh my God, terrorist attack, we're all dangerous, we're all in trouble. You, you empower the terrorists by overestimating their power. Well, the same thing in information warfare. If you think, oh my God, these people, you know, they can bring a giant, giant company to its knees by, by threatening, uh, you know, by, by writing a letter saying you're, you're doing cultural appropriations. We can break that by standing up to it to a very large extent. That, by the way, can I just say, Liz Cheney, the Republican member of Congress, was third in the leadership, got kicked out of her leadership post in the House were calling out the big lie, saying it was a lie, saying Republicans should have nothing to do with it. Well, you know, you'd think she's the loser in that equation, but I believe history will show that people like her and Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder, and those four Maricopa County supervisors, all Republicans, all who put a marker in the ground and said, this is a lie, there is no truth to it, do not believe it, history will show that they made a difference by providing those anchors to reality that the rest of the people can gradually come and, and organize around and rally around. Yeah. Well, if I was a Republican, I'd be worried because if the party's divided between those people and the Trump people, clearly there's still a lot of Trumpers out there. Uh, they're going to lose every election to the Democrats. So they, they need to do something, and it's obvious which direction they need to go. When you see a spiral of silence, break it. All right. Finally, Jonathan, what, do you have any tips to say to people that encounter somebody at, at work, at the water cooler, at the Thanksgiving dinner with a family member who says Trump won or QAnon is real or whatever, conspiracy theory or crazy idea. How do you talk to somebody? Yeah, it turns out, it turns out that the best way to convince someone is by not trying to convince them. Um, try to listen, try to understand where the person's coming from. Throwing facts at them generally doesn't work. But it was... Um, I think it was Cass Sunstein that brought to my attention this, this wonderful quotation from Dale Carnegie, of all people, who said, you can't make people agree with you, but you can make them want to agree with you. And it turns out in many cases, not every case, it's really hard to change people's minds, especially if they're part of what amounts to a cult. But it turns out that if you can be a better listener, instead of hitting them head on and saying you're wrong, you say, well, why do you believe that? Okay, so... Just walk me through it. If there was a massive conspiracy to steal the election, who actually did it? And how did they coordinate it in all the states that they would have had to do it with no one noticing? And where did they put all the ballots? That, can you explain this to me? So once you start doing that and you start seeming receptive and curious, that's a way in, at least to the right kind of conversation. But remember, Immunity to this kind of information warfare is going to come when it comes not primarily from convincing every individual. It's going to come from creating social barriers to the spread at the wholesale level of misinformation in the first place. And it's going to come from rejecting politicians like Donald Trump and many, many leaders of the Republican Party who are using these tactics to begin with. Yeah, I'm fond of pointing out that uh, they, they seem, seemingly forgot to rig the election for the congressional seats that now cost them both the House and the Senate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's another good one. Right. They won. They gave themselves the presidency, but, but they decided to give up seats in the House. It's yeah. not a super good uh, conspiracy. No, no. I also ask, uh, in a more Columbo style of, uh, of just asking questions, um, 
So when when uh, Attorney General Bill Barr, you know, lifelong uh, Republican and hardcore supporter of Trump, uh, said the election wasn't rigged, what? How did you receive that, or how do how do you make heads of that? It's like, huh? Yeah, he's on our team, or you know, Vice President Pence. You know, you look up loyalty and it's a picture of him, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, how do you make sense of that? Yeah, a lot of what matters. A lot of what matters is not just presenting facts, but who presents them. And that's another reason that what Liz Cheney and Stephen Richer and the others did was so important. They are on the same team. Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for your work, especially for the new book, Constitution of Knowledge. What's next on your uh, writing research plate? I don't know yet. I'm just going to try to make as much noise as I can with, with this book. And I'm grateful you to having me on the show to help do that well it's a long road to a uh, long road to hoe that's for sure long hoe or no road to hoe that's it that's right <laughs> we'll we'll, we'll I, don't, I, don't, I can't say there. we'll get there but uh we can continue to get there uh in the centuries-long pursuit of these constitution of knowledge well done thank you